Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's session of Stowe Talks and thank you for joining. So my name's Shneeka and I'm a senior associate at Stowe and I'm also joined by my colleague Jake, who's a sister and works in the Leeds team with me. We're also joined today by Sarah Weller. Sarah runs the Weller Way, which is a family relationship coaching practice. She's Absolutely. a experienced consultant, breathwork coach and certified NLP practitioner and she's based in Tunbridge Wells in Kent. Sarah's coaching approach is entirely holistic and it ensures that the needs of the whole family are met. She offers sessions that are face-to-face -face and online on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but also group workshops. So the focus of today is how to support children emotionally through divorce and beyond. We'll be covering topics such as how to talk to your child about divorce, how to navigate difficulties with co-parenting, but also how to try and make a success of it too. So there's just a few housekeeping points before I hand over to Sarah. You're all already muted, so there's no need to worry about that. Uh, feel free to use the chat function throughout the session, but please be respectful of each other. This is intended to be a safe space for everyone, and we understand that this will be an emotive topic, so just be mindful of everyone in the session. Feel free to grab a drink and a snack. We want this to be a relaxed and comfortable environment, and please do add your questions to the Q&A section. Jake, Sarah and I will answer them at the end of the session. And just as one final point, this session is recorded and will be sent to everyone after the session. Over to you, Sarah. Hi, welcome everybody. Lovely to see you. And thanks, um, Kate, for um, inviting me on behalf of Stowe. So I'm going to talk to you today about supporting children through divorce. Um, my main expertise is helping families become fully functional, and that's any family. Um, it's about strengthening the family unit, whatever that looks like. Um, I'm not a particular expert in divorce and co-parenting, but my expertise is more about restoring or repairing attachment if there's difficulties as a result of divorce. And also my other expertise is in um, helping parents understand the impact of neurodivergency, either on themselves or their children. So I've, I've looked at some of research, uh, current research for this talk um, to uh, complement my own thoughts and um, musings as well. So I just wanted to start with um, what are the fundamental concepts for children's well-being? And to do this, I looked at Michael Lamb's meta study, which is mothers, fathers, families and circumstances, factors affecting children's adjustment. And I'm just going to read you what the report, um, how it sums up the features of a supportive childhood. So the report states children do well when they have good relationships with both parents or primary caregivers. Adults who basically get along, but those parents don't need to be married or living together in the same house. Children benefit from emotionally stable parents adults who are recuperated enough in the case of divorce to focus on the basic job of parenting, including establishing stability, exercising fair discipline, providing love and being emotionally responsive. But again, those parents don't need to be married or living in the same house. And the, the main other one was children need adequate resources such as food, safe housing and social support. But the report writes, but they don't need a mansion with every toy available. And their resources can be provided by parents who are not married or living in the same house. So research and that was conducted um, more recently showed that among older children and adolescents, authoritative parenting was associated with social competence, self-confidence, positive engagement, and non-involvement in delinquent and antisocial behavior. And that's what I specialize in authoritative parenting. So authoritative is using um, these five C's in essence, and we call it good enough parenting. Um, we know that there's no such thing as uh, perfect parenting, but my take on authoritative is um, where communication is open, non-judgmental, accepting and sensitive, cooperation, so it's collaborative and flexible, and that means it's not uh, parenting through control. You're parenting the child in front of you and not the one you want, 
and you're respecting their thoughts, feelings and choices, but working together to find collaborative solutions. Connection is an obvious one, it's being available and fully present. It's not about big outings, it's not about big gestures, it is literally about quality uninterrupted time. Co-regulation, that's the ability to help children understand their feelings. And that's about being with them in their distress um, without judging or trying to fix. And I think in our very sort of left hand, left hand brain sort of problem solving society that we live in, we can often um, want positively, intentionally want to fix, but it prevents us listening and helping children work out their own solutions. But I think the most, probably the most critical thing through the process of separation and divorce is the importance of being able to provide emotional stability for your child or children by being emotionally stable yourself. And that's where obviously you need a lot of support. Um, and the last thing is consistency and all of the above, but also consistency in the ability to um, put in your boundaries and limits. And so we're using discipline to teach, but we're using discipline to teach your values, which is very different to behavioral rules. So we're, we're, we're trying to base all our parenting on helping our children um, sort of, you know, operate within our value set. So that's the main sort of foundations and pillars, I think, of it, children's emotional well-being, um, the sort of physical and the um, physical and the, the emotional sort of needs. Um, so I was just looking at I think what children need um, post divorce, which is obviously probably why you're on the webinar. So um, as I've already talked about, it's just summarizing that research. It's a strong relationship with either one or both. Parents. I'm going to talk about the the um, the one pet because um, we know that the, all the research states, as I said, that it's it's children are not affected by by being single parented. It's good enough parenting. We know that divorce does not affect children per se but what does affect them is the um, witnessing of conflict, whether that's emotional um, conflict or physical con conflict um, or financial, you know, um, financial withdrawal. So time to talk and active listening, maintenance of the of familiar routine, the reassurance of unconditional loving and that it wasn't their fault. And I'm going to bring in that about later on about how, how we'll talk, present the divorce to children. But in the absence of a parent, if um, a parent is not able to have capacity as a parent, there is within attachment theory, this idea of earned attachment. So looking for other people around you like grandparents or god godparents or aunts and uncles or sort of people in the community um, that take that sort of attachment figure role. So the main risks are um, obviously when a child's economic situation deteriorates, um, when one or a parent abandons a child, as I've said, when there's conflict, um, when a parent loses parenting capacity, and I mean that by um, mental health challenges, stress, um, so that they're unable to be emotionally present for their children. Um, the obvious ones when a, a step parent's harsh or rejecting, um, but they're the obvious ones, but I just added in um, two which I think are quite impactful. And that can be if you've got neurodivergent children, um, the rigid path thinking patterns that they can have and they can assign blame within that rigid thinking patterns. But also we know that children with um, ADHD particularly often hand in hand they have what we call rejection sensitive dysphoria, which means that um, they um, interpret um, a loss or a removal of a parent very, very 
very painfully as a very, very painful rejection. And it's quite likely then um, that you can see some quite severe behavioral challenges within that. Um, so just supporting that really, there was there's a report by um, there's some research. I, I think it might be helpful, Kate, if I put the links in an email to you to the research rather than me reading all the people it's by. Would that yeah, help people? Fine. Yeah, so just all my referencing. Yeah, and um, I'll share it in the follow-up email afterwards for everybody. That's no problem. Yeah, great. So um the latest research I could find was 2010, um, which states within the risk factors, the primary causes of increased maladjustment about among children or adolescents in one parent families are disturbed relationships with one or both of the parents. So that backs up that idea that the divorce is um, is there's a risk to children's well-being and mental health when there's high conflict afterwards. So 50 years ago, it was widely assumed that the absence of male parental figures accounted for the maladjustment of some children. So that research was done in the 1970s. But the notion that children need to have both male and female parents in order to be well adjusted has not now been supported by research. Um, so 1999, um, Silverstein and Oberbach. And research conducted over the last four decades has demonstrated that both mothers and, and fathers are important to their children as parents, but not as males and females, so that the parent's gender does not affect children's either. So just summarizing so far, research on children in both traditional and non-traditional families has demonstrated that father absence is not itself important to adjustment. Instead, it is the quality of the parent-child relationship, the quality of the co-parenting relationship, the quality of the child's experiences and the adequacy of resources. So some children may think that divorce is a threat to happiness. But Warwick University's extensive millennium cohort study of 2014 found that there was not a significant difference in the happiness levels of the children that they um, did the research with, which was over 12,000. So it was quite a significant study. Um, so there wasn't a significant level of difference in happiness between two parent families and one parent families. So I know I've put all this in because I know that there can be a lot of guilt about considering a separation, about the impact of a separation. So I just wanted um, to reassure people that um, it's not just me that's saying it doesn't. I'm just hopefully I've backed it up with, with some substantial research. So how to tell children so I'm going to uh, this is some general stuff um, and then I'm going to go through chrono chronological age um, so I thought that might be most helpful starting from very little is to teenagers so these are the general rules keep it factual um, which I know is difficult oh, because it's high you are in a highly emotional state so just keeping it factual, say that you've decided you can't live together any longer and so that you will live separately. So children um, need to know the sort of the next stage on, otherwise it produces a lot of anxiety. If you sort of are vague about that, then that can cause a lot of anxiety. Ideally, if you can talk to your children together and both accept the responsibility for the breakdown. Again, a factual response that you've decided that you can't live together anymore. Um, it is helpful if you believe this is to be the case, um, that you did your best to save the marriage and that the decision to live apart was not made lightly. Obviously my suggestions are within your framework of authenticity. I'm not encouraging you to lie. 
um, but just to be as authentic as you can on just giving you some ideas. Um, the most important thing is not to apologize for the decision um, and to um, help them um, sort of um, be prepared that it might be a tough transition in the short term, but it will give everybody a better life in the long run. Um, and this is this you can bring in your reference if they've seen you fighting or arguing. Um, you know, you can say that you will become better parents when you apart. Stress that each of you is still in a family, although it will possibly be a blended family and you'll still stay connected. Um, we assure them that they're not responsible for the separation. Um, that is a thing particularly to be mindful of with teenagers. Um, they can um, be lots of overthinking and catastrophizing. Um, and I'm going to mention this later on with teenagers because sometimes they take it on their sort of on their mission to try and get you back together. Um, so it's important to emphasize that this is a decision that is non-negotiable because, you know, and you're not going to reconsider. Don't make promises you can't keep and don't ask children who they want to live with. Um, so I hope you're not furiously scribbling all this down because I forgot to say you will get the slides. So it's really the most important thing is to make it age appropriate and to just um, moderate what that previous slide was. Um, so obviously with toddlers and preschoolers, the simpler the explanation, the, the better. Expect to have lots of questions. You probably will get, may get quite worn down by the questions because the, the working memory is not there at this age. So they'll want lots of reassurance and may be asking you the same questions over and over again. Um, very important to let them know what the practical arrangements will be in terms of their routine, what will change, what won't change. Um, and so going back to what I just said, don't expect that one conversation will do the job. You might have to have many because of, of the working memory is not there. Expect big emotions, expect behaviours driven by emotional instability. Watch for faulty thinking and there may be changes in sleep, eye wakefulness, and all these things I've put them there because it, they're very, very normal. So what do they need? They need a maintenance of a normal routine as much as possible and to provide them with the reassurance and um, young children know they're safe because of their routine. And their main, the main caregiver to be fully present for co-regulation. So it's really important when I talk about co-regulation that your self-care, it's an obvious one, but self-care is really, really um, an important part of your, your next steps as if you're the main, particularly if you're the main caregiver. So then I've put six to 11, this is more sort of juniors. And this is where, because of the um, more connected brain, trying to make sense of the experience in terms of sort of child development and what's going on in the brain. They may assign blame for the split. So that's why I said it was really important to uh, communicate that it's a joint decision. Again, similar big emotions, you may get some defiance or uncooperation. The defiance and uncooperation is very normal because when a child feels that they're out of control or some decision has been made that they haven't been able to influence or being able to control, they will try and claw back control as much as they can. So that can present as defiance again, very, very normal. And they may start having fantasies about reconciliation and how they can bring that about. So again, what do they need? Very similar to infants, um, maintenance of the normal routine um, as much as possible, co-regulation. Um, but at this point, more talking about their feelings. So little is you can do more through distraction and probably physical touch and play, um, but six to 11s will probably need more, well, they will need more 
sort of helping organize their feelings. Um, using books can be very good um, with this age, uh, using books to help them understand their feelings and that their feelings are perfectly normal. So teens, now this is where, is it normal or is it not normal or is it a teen thing or is it it's because we've got irritability and anger are very common anyway. So it's hard to gauge what is the reaction to the divorce and what's hormones and what's normal adolescent stuff. There's quite likely to be quite a lot of anger directed at you because you're there to receive it. Um, there'll be lots of testing boundaries to see if you actually care. And so that's where those uh, limits and boundaries connected to your values are so important because it's your values that that create the why once they see the why then it's they can see that it logically makes sense rather than arbitrary rules they can often um, teenagers can often absorb secondary stress and what i mean by that um, is that they can absorb your stress um, because they get much better by this point of, of reading the room, reading what's going on um, and um, sensing energy. Um, and of course, that absorption of secondary stress can amplify the irritability and anger. Um, but on the other hand, um, they might not go into fight. They may go into flight, which means they might start um, getting some quite significant anxiety or sadness. Um, but again, be child led, um, be there listening, um, try not to judge the behavior. Um, and probably at this point, their friends may be more important than you. So they might more likely open up to their friends, um, because the natural adolescent brain is driving away from you to more independence towards their friends. This is where um, counselors or school can be really helpful. Um, I meant to say with the little ones, play therapy can be really helpful if um, um, small children are really struggling. And the main, one of the main things is, is try not to talk about the court proceedings or financial worries with your teens. I know it's nice to have a sort of listening ear available, but try and keep that um, for with your friends or your parents, um, because it can add to that worry that um, the team might start thinking that they're a financial burden on you and a drain, um, which affects their self-esteem. So I hope that's helpful. Um, so within behavior to particularly notice that might not be within the realms of normal. We have to consider the effects of attachment and if there's any rupture of attachment and if it needs to be repaired. Um, and it's easy to repair. There's lots of attachment interventions out there. I That's a lot of the work I do. Um, but it's just, um, I think, noticing what's going on when it becomes sort of going, going on for a long time. So we've got within attachment theory, we've got um, an anxious style of attachment where um, a child can be overly clingy. So we can get lots of separation anxiety. Um, we can, um, they can be um, become but very anxious, so become avoidant. So not, not going out and doing things, not taking acceptable risks, not being curious about the world. It can be difficult to soothe and quite destructive if told no. Um, we've got insecure, ambivalent, which is very loud, um, whereas anxious is, is quieter. So very angry and defiant, destructive, um, and can become quite manipulative. So only showing affection when they want something. 
and then we can have the insecure avoidant. So that's the child that always puts your needs first rather than their needs. So they become that, that police. And that, that can be a divorce if a parent is really struggling um, in capacity the child can take on um, that sort of taking care of, of, of their main caregiver, which could possibly lead to insecure avoidant attachment. So it's just, um, I just put that in really because um, they're just to, um, again, encourage that if there are any attachment disorder type of behaviours being picked up, there are lots of interventions that um, can be used and it is never too late. You can always restore attachment. That's what the lovely optimism about attachment theory is. So, as I said, I'm not really um, an expert on um, the sort of making a co-parenting plan. I, I think, Kate, you've got somebody, a real expert coming up, haven't you, in a Another talk um, I saw on your Instagram, you've got somebody who specialises in co-parenting, I think. I think well, we've had co-parenting experts before. Uh, I'm not sure if we've got anything coming up at the moment, but we've, 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 yeah. we've got some, we've well, got maybe some it's a podcast. resources. Yeah. You've got a podcast, haven't you? Yeah, we've yeah. got a really good podcast. So I was just here. going to... Yeah. I was oh, going to direct yeah. you to his pod... Direct the audience to... The podcast which is on your instagram feed i think it's the one with tom nash that's yeah. it yeah that's the man yes yeah yeah he is, so I thought he that is might, very good yeah so i thought that might complement this talk that's why i mentioned it but there's a really good um template on the internet which you can use as a really good i don't know if you've got your own at stowe but this one's really good which i've um used sometimes in the past yeah so, there, there is also the CAFCAS resources that um yeah. can be utilized um they have a very detailed parenting plan that would probably complement this one very well yeah yeah that's what I thought so I wasn't going to talk much about co-parenting because I hope that I have instilled um some optimism that if the co-parenting doesn't work out there is no major damage to a child's mental health or well-being because of the reasons I've given. Um, so I'm summarising those reasons again. Good enough parenting, earned attachment, quality experiences, and by that I mean that that one-to-one -one uninterrupted time with any significant adult so quality experiences I don't I'm not talking about big posh days out that sort of thing um and reducing so I just want to talk about transitions because again transitions can be a tension point a lot of the time so I think if um transitions are tricky this is possibly because um, children find it really hard to transfer attachment from one adult to another in a short space of time they find it really difficult to switch so their attachment needs to different to, to the co-parents so it's really helpful to allow children just a settling in time, what I call a grounding time. So it's a time when you have picked them up and taken them to your house. Um, try to reduce demands on them. That's a really, um, that could be a tension point, a sort of flick of the switch moment for them. So just try and reduce demands and just let them just ground, settle. That might be watching TV or, you know, going on there their tech um, before you're making demands on them. Um, this, um, I was just thinking about this also, it's, it's, um, it's nice to have all the basics in your home as well if you're a co-parent so that they don't feel like a visitor. So it's literally a sort of home to home. Um, 
but also if the transitions are difficult, um, then it can help that they're in a neutral territory. Um, either a play or a playground, or maybe um, for you as the divorcee, I think the most um, important things for you to be able to take care of those five C's that I talk about, for you to be a good enough parent is absolutely quality self-care. And I don't mean by that um, bubble baths and massages and facials. I don't mean that sort of quality self-care. I mean, looking after yourself in terms of eating regularly, um, exercising, some downtime, some quiet time, um, all those things that can restore your stress levels and keep you in balance so that you're able to be that consistent caregiver. Robust boundaries um, with yourself about what you take on um, in extra responsibilities, but also robust boundaries with your children and robust boundaries with your partner, ex-partner. Um, and just be aware of your triggers for dysregulation. I did a whole talk about this, Kate, didn't I, for um, oh, Breakup Club. I talked a lot about what the triggers were within with post-divorce and it's what we call our shark music and it's often the things that that triggered us in the old relationship we can take into um, the new relationship. Um, I think um, just a, a few sort of no's um, which is sort of my my, my sort of no's is I've already said, don't share your financial worries. Don't let your children take care of you, i.e. there's a care reversal role. Don't talk about your love life in front of them and don't use them as messengers. So that really um, is a very whistle-stop tour. And I hope that I've... Um, I wanted to reassure people, that's the one thing I really wanted to do, is reassure people that there is no significant impact on, of divorce on children's mental well-being um, because children's adjustment is affected by the quality of their experiences and the well-being of those around them, not by the makeup and, st and structure of their family. So if you can focus on the five C's um, and um, as much as you can, um, that will give you the foundations for children's well-being. Thank you for listening. Thank you, that was fantastic. And I just want to echo that last comment Sarah's made about um, not worrying about the structure of a family. It's, it's advice that we very often give that two happy homes are far better than one unhappy home and children will always pick up on that. Um, now we'll move on to the Q&A section. So there's some questions here, um, most of which are for you, Sarah. Um, so I'll, I'll speak slowly while you take a drink. Um, so the first question is, what are your suggestions for good parenting attributes when you're parallel parenting and there's either no or very little communication with the other parent due to pre-separation abuse? Yeah. It's, sorry, um, I might have to, could you read that again? Yeah, of course. I don't, I, I have quite slow auditory processing, sorry. No, it's fine. So what are your suggestions for a good parenting attributes when you're parallel parenting and there's no or very little communication uh, due to pre-separation abuse? Yeah. So this is where um, co-parenting is, is really tricky and challenging because of the, the abuse. And if, if that wasn't able to be resolved during the relationship, then it's very likely that it's not, go it's, it's not going to stop. So 
really it, it's cutting your losses, I think, because you cannot be a co, you cannot be the three C's if you yourself are being used as a battering ram, if you yourself are being abused. Because that is, um, that will be reducing your parenting capacity. And so it's more important, I think, that um, you are able to um, have be resilient as a, as the main caregiver. And so that question really is a very good question. Um, if I knew more details, then I would be able to give more specific answers. But just generally, I think that encapsulates the whole theme of the talk that um, sometimes we think in an ideal world, we should be push, push, pushing for this situation of a, a good co-parenting. Um, but sometimes it is more damaging to you as the um, reciprocant of the um, continued uh, uh, abuse and non-cooperation because that reduces your parental capacity. Does that answer the question? I think so. And I, I would just add to that that there are quite a few helpful parent, um, apps that can be used to help with communication for parents that are in that situation. So um, a lot of clients that have experienced domestic abuse don't want their ex-partner to have a direct line into um, their phone. It, it causes anxiety to see messages pop up and the, the parenting apps create a degree of separation from that. So you're not constantly getting the messages straight through to your phone. Some of them also um, warn parties about the tone of what they're putting in, which is helpful. And if you do find yourself in a difficult situation in the future, parenting apps don't allow messages to be deleted like it can happen on WhatsApp. So if you ever did need to rely on things that have been said in evidence, that they're quite a helpful tool just, just for that degree of separation, but also protection moving forward. Yeah, and that's what one of the things I, I meant to say with the boundaries, it's boundaries over communication. How do you want to receive communication rather than having to accept the communication that's being foisted on upon you? Yeah, I agree. Um, so next question is, um, so the comment is, this has been very reassuring. Um, could you say a little bit more about reassuring children? It's not their fault. Would you recommend bringing this up with them? Yes, uh, definitely, because um, this leads into um, can affect self-worth, um, particularly if um, a new relationship is formed post-divorce and perhaps a baby comes along. Um, I've, uh, you know, that can be really discombobulating for the child that's been left because they can um, think that they're not not loved so it's really important um, to express the um, sentiment that they're not being divorced as a child they are not being divorced and that that's a really important message to to send home that you know they're still very much loved you know um and this was this is um two people who want to be your parents but they can't um be in a romantic relationship with each other and, and stay stay married um, because they don't they don't get on anymore. Okay. Um, so next question: What advice do you have for someone who now realizes they were married to someone with significant narcissist characteristics? And how can I best help my daughter navigate her time with her father? This question is very, very um, common. Um, narcissism is one of those things that is um, the, well, the very, very challenging because uh, a narcissist uh, um, will need to be in control the whole time. Um, and when they're not in control and when they have been perceived rejection, they can become very um, punitive. So um, again, it's making sure that you have a very robust support around you um, and some very expert help 
Um, so there's a, a lot. I believe you have um, ex, an expert at Stowe, don't you, Kate, um, to help with this? Um, no, we work a lot with a lady called Dr. Supriya McKenna. Um, she, yeah, yeah. So we do quite a lot with her. She doesn't work for Stowe, but um, she's probably, I would say, the the person that we've sort of had the most on doing talks and, po and podcasts and stuff. So again, I can pop some links in the chat, but I would say she's probably a real expert in trying to understand the behaviours and what to do about them. And I, I think what I've seen is it's no point trying to persuade your, um, your child to have a view of their parent. That just won't work. It's about letting them become mature enough to see it for themselves and then make up their own mind because otherwise you will be a battering ram for their, their um, sort of um, distress if you try and present an alternative view or stop them seeing them. So I think it's often better to let things naturally progress and, and for a young person to, to have their own experience and within reason, obviously, um, so that not that they're not safe but um so that they can make their own mind and see what um the, the level of the narcissism themselves okay so how do you suggest we deal with a parent who refuses to comply with a parenting plan um so i can take this from a legal point of yeah. view um if the issue is that they're not turning up to contact to collect the child then um, you're in a difficult situation because you know, the, the other route is to try to go down the court route, but it's very rare for a court to try to force a parent or a child to spend time with a parent who isn't committed to that relationship. So um, it's, it's really a case of managing it as best you can. If it's the opposite and they're trying to see the child outside of the agreed arrangements, then you can always apply to court. Um, a court order will regulate that contact and if it's not adhered to, um, the court can sanction the other person or the alternative is to try mediation and see if there's a middle ground it might just be that the parents plan's not working and it needs a bit of tweaking all of which a lawyer can advise with on what's what's normal and what's within the standard parameters that a court would would approve in in terms of an order um, I don't know if you've got anything to add to that Sarah from just a communication point of view no okay. um no I again I think um I think um when there's the emotional shark music with either parent. It's much, much safer um, to use an impartial person um, to negotiate around that. How do you handle um, a case of preteen children when you don't approve of the friendships if, of their close circle? Um, due to bad manners, poor focus and disrespectful behaviour. So that's one for you, Sarah. I'm not sure the family court can help with that one. No, again, it's just being very, very clear on um, your own values and, 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 and why and ramming it home, why, why, why. Um, any perceived um, criticism of um, a, a teen's um, peer group will um, potentially alienate them uh, so it's 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 a hard one but again um just going back to sort of my previous life working in a homeless hostel I saw this a lot I saw a lot of um um you know um sort of troubled peer influence on some of our clients and it was no good the, the more the more you are presenting a different view the, the more you're driving them towards wanting to be with those but what eventually happened was that when uh, um, that client's needs were better met in terms of whether that was, um, you know, find, going, going back into education or, or getting a job or um, starting a sort of romantic relationship, they started to realise that there was more, there was more and, and there was better stuff available to them. And again, they started making up their own minds. 
Um, and this is, it's so hard. It's one of the hardest things as a parent, but if you trust in your um, foundations that you've set, you trust that they've got that, um, that solid foundation uh, of that core understanding of your values. You might, might have a rocky road, but you will, they will eventually return to it when they are able to, uh, when they have sufficiently matured. And um, yeah, it's, it will happen, but there's, there's that awful, that awful bit of time when they may have to learn the hard way. But it's about you being available um, to pick up the pieces when it all goes wrong. Um, and to make them um, understand that 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 you you will be there. Okay. So the next question is: How do you handle the situation if your co-parent discusses fault and finance while you listen and remain neutral? So I'll just add the quick legal perspective to that. Um, if if you have a regulated order that uh, an agreement that is formalised by way of court order, then you can apply back to court, and the court looks very dimly on that approach. Um, again, a solicitor's letter is sometimes enough to nip it in the bud. Um, but generally speaking, it's something that um, parents just have to navigate um, between them and, and try and hope that the child will realise the truth in, in the end. And I'm sure Sarah will um, echo that statement. There's, um, there's not a great deal that legally you can do to regulate someone's behaviour. If, if they're going to act like that, they generally are going to do that regardless of of what the family court or, or any lawyer has said to them. Yeah, I, I agree, agree totally with that. Um, parental alienation is something that I come across um, sometimes. Um, it's a very hard one to, um, to cope with. Um, and it really is, I think, really useful for the parent who's doing the alienating to get some sort of psychoeducation um, as to what impact that is having on the child, because sometimes the, the parent who's doing it doesn't realize the impact and the damage they're causing um, because they're so sort of stuck in their own emotional dysregulation. Um, so sometimes um, I know that um, so, so solicitors I've worked with have, have suggested certainly to courts that um, that the, the parent who's doing the alienating um, has some sort of parenting psychoeducation. Yeah, and in any extreme circumstances, the court can um, intervene in the relationship to the extent that it, it will end in order to protect the child, um, mm. which would see a change in, in residency or, or child arrangements in that situation. Um, so uh, what if one parent chooses not to talk, so communicating through the child is the only option? Um, again, I'll, ju I'll just throw my two pennies worth in that, that that's not something the court would ever endorse. Um, so if you were in that forum, it, it wouldn't be something that any judge would be happy with. Um, it's different if you've got an older child in their teen years that wants to move freely between two houses. But even then, it's, it's something you've got to be really careful with. Yeah, it, because it really does interfere with attachment. Okay, um, how and when do you introduce a new partner? Drip, drip, drip. The way is not to um, bring them round to your house, not for them to come into the family home straight away. Um, it's talking about them first, um, talking about them fondly um, that way so that they're aware of the presence of that person and then um, the face-to-face -face I'd recommend is in neutral territory. So when you're out, so maybe again, you meet up out somewhere. But I think the, the difficulties are when it's, um, there's, they're, they're sort of in, brought into the home quite suddenly and can be quite, quite a shock. And again, it's not very collaborative. So that's what, when I go, talk about the communication the collaborative communication is just um you um children always surprise me that um i was at a at an um uh, a birthday party uh, a couple of weeks ago and my very good friend has um, got divorced 
and she's met this new man and she's she's living with him and it's all very lovely um but he completely railroaded the birthday party um by proposing and his adult children went ballistic <laughs> they're sort of early teens how very dare he he hasn't asked our permission you know and it was it was the shock and so i think it's just to avoid any of that emotional shock um for children um just gently gently drip feed I think I would just add to that point. Legally, there is there is no time frame of when it should or shouldn't happen. Um, lawyers generally say that when it's a long term, committed, serious relationship and that any introduction should be child led and involving the other parents. So warning them that this is what you're thinking of doing and maybe agreeing some ground rules from the outset um, can help with that transition. But um, to really just focus it on the child and, and how they're going to react. Um, so how to ensure balanced time with both parents when one parent lives abroad and comes and goes as and when they can without any collaboration with the caregiving parent? Yeah. So that does come down to some sort of structured communication um, with with the with the children. Um, and so I I I think using technology to have uh, regular FaceTimes or um you know zoom zoom family meetings or um is a, a, in part as part of the routine so it's built in in the week so it's not random um is again if they're coming and going that's inconsistent and children need the structure and need the routine and need to know when they can have i mean that's not to say they can't have the spontaneous communication but just to get something sort of regularly structured in during the week as some sort of um, you know regular touching base and checking in using tech. I agree and it's, it's that level of respect that giving you as much notice as possible and trying to regulate that communication you know give me as much warning as possible and we can make this work because consistency and certainty is, is, is what's the most important for children with, with that degree of flexibility where where it's necessary, but structure is, is one of the more important things. Um, so with an ex and her narcissistic qualities, when she opposes things and won't share co-parenting and the teen won't return calls, and I've been trying for three years now and my son is 16 and won't speak. So is there any advice that we can give to this person? Sorry, can you repeat that you went a bit? Uh, yes, sorry. So um, we, we've got a, a, a mother, as it appears, um, opposing contact and won't co-parent and a teenager that won't recall, return calls who's 16 um, and it's been three years. So the mum doesn't want to co-parent with the yes. father? Yeah, yeah. And, and the teen is old with no contact for three years. No contact with the mum? No, with the father. With the father. Does the, well, does the teen want contact? It's, it says the teen's not returning calls. So um, it, it seems not whether that's their own views or, or whether it's views that have been pushed on them. Um, from, from a legal point of view, when, once you're at the age of 16, the court tends not to get involved unless it's extreme circumstances, um, just merely due to, the, due to the fact that 16 year olds will tend to vote with their feet. And there's not a great deal that you can do about them, but I'm sure Sarah's. Well, not not really. I mean, again, it's it's um, it's a level of per we need to. I can't answer it without really knowing that specifically without knowing the level of parental alienation. It's obviously you know quite significant in this in this case, and there's obviously some really strong um reasons why why mum doesn't mum doesn't want to and whether that's that's to do with you know domestic abuse worried about that the child is not going to be safe um and ex or experience abuse um and um yeah so that there could be lots of you know really valid and important reasons why mum doesn't want to um but again um you can't you just can't force a 16 year old um 
to do something that, that they don't want to do. Um, but hopefully the people around them will, will encourage them to, to, so that, that that boy or girl knows that if they want to, eventually they can, so that there is there will be that open door for them, maybe if it's safe for them to do, to, to, to do so. But this could be a protection that the teen may be protecting himself from future hurt. Um, uh, sometimes um, children do miscue in the fact that um, they're worried about um, resuming a contact with, with an adult in case they get hurt again, because there's trust issues. So if I get close to you again, what happens to me if you go somewhere else or leave me again? So often when, when children are not you know, avoiding, it's because it's self-protection, it's self-defense, and it's to do with trust. I agree. Um, and and also there are situations where it is parental alienation. And, and like I said, the, the court will look at that it generally won't involve itself with 16 year olds, but in exceptional circumstances where there is damage being done, there is an exception to that rule. So it would be worthwhile seeking um, med uh, legal advice as to whether there are options available to you moving forward. But I think whoever you speak to would, would need much more information. Um, mm. How do you deal with abusive grandparents who constantly criticize a child and are being racist to the child and the parent? Well, I would recommend family relationship coaching, which is what I do, um, to have joint family sessions on um, restoring that, that connection and ways of um, parenting that is authoritative rather than judgmental, critical and, yeah racist so it's it's again it's about psychoeducation as well understanding the damage that is being um you know um to to the young to the young person um so or it's um maybe contacting early help um getting some advice from them to see if they they could um facilitate um group family work but also, you know, having the confidence to, to do what you need to do to safeguard your child in your relationship. You know, if, if a relationship is not healthy and if there is issues with racism or, or, or a mental, physical, emotional abuse, um, the court wouldn't endorse a relationship anyway. Um, there's grandparents in this situation. So they if they wanted to to instigate that contact, there's an extra level of um, protection from your point of view because they don't automatically have the option to go through the court process there is a gatekeeping exercise um and, and you know in most situations where you you turned up to court and explained all you know the situation that you're in now um that application is unlikely to get past that gatekeeping exercise in any event so um you, you are allowed to, to put your boundaries down and say no this isn't right for me and my child in in circumstances where you've exhausted other options and and you can't find a, a solution um but also it goes it goes back to as well you know the, the ability to find earned attachment so although yes it's very sad that that child's not going to have that um relationship with with their grandparents um maybe look to see within your extended family um where there can be that sort of replace those sort of replacement figures you know, or it could be, you know, a fam family friends um, so that they have that sort of men mentorship that older people can offer. Um, how would you advise to deal with a parent who's made up fictitious allegations of domestic violence, refuses to talk directly to the other parent, um, but continues to pass messages via the child? Um, so I think I think we've dealt with this one. Um, we've dealt with the issue of domestic um, abuse and, and also with parental alienation um, and, and, and how to deal with children being involved. I don't know if you've got anything extra to add to what we've already said, Sarah. No, I, I, I just want uh, it's hard, but I just the, for me, the, the threads and themes of my talk are to encourage the um, confidence in you as a main caregiver 
um, to be able to um, accept that um, single caregiving is good enough. And if it's just so stressful and so, you know, yeah, um, pull away, but have confidence in yourself, resource yourself, look for all the support you can get. Um, yeah. So how do you deal with a preteen who doesn't want to spend time with her dad? So, but from a legal point, no one's no, no one's going to force her. She she would be spoken to. Um, consideration would be given to why she didn't want to spend time with her father. If there was a good reason, um, safeguards might be put in place. If it's an emotional thing that's something she needs to work through, then um, the court would consider a stepped arrangement. Um, but any any decision would be made with her views and wishes in mind and, and what's in the best interest of, of her individually, not what you want, not what he wants, um, but solely on what's better, best for her. Um, so, you know, practical advice from a lawyer is to just persevere and try and speak positively about the parent and maybe try and get to the, to the root of why it is she doesn't want to visit because there is, if there is something deeper, um, then there can be things that are put in place to protect her. And those deeper things, I think, can be loyalty. Um, if 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 your mum is particularly distressed about your, their ex, then there's that sense of, am I being disloyal by going to see him? So there's that sort of protective level. And also um, what I said about the difficulty in transferring attachment. Um, also, there may be the fact that that um, child doesn't feel that their dad understands them or they have shared interests or similar you know it, it could be so it, it it could be worth at this point exploring using a counsellor I think maybe okay we've got about six more questions here and it is half past six now so I don't know Sarah if, if you're able to stay on a bit longer to answer a few more um I can I've got a client at seven so I'll have to go about ten two but that's fine. We're, um, we, I'm sure we can go through um, most of these fairly quickly. So um, what happens if a co-parent refuses to use a parenting app? Well, I think that the short answer that any lawyer would give is you can't force force behaviour from another person. So if, if they refuse to use a parenting app and there's a safety issue, um, then there are things that lawyers can help you put in place to um, protect you from that communication um, by way of non-molestation order or injunction um, but if it's just a case of a co-parent refusing to use an app and, and, and you know continual communication then, then you would have that court option to regulate it. Sarah I don't know if you have any practical advice for that one though no? okay fine. Um, I think this is one for you what about the situation where it's obvious it wasn't a joint decision to separate slash divorce. That is a tricky one. Um, it, yeah, without knowing the circumstances. So if there's, you know, obviously abuse, then that is, that's a difficult one, isn't it? To, um, because you can't really tell a, tell a child, you know, and, threaten their sense of safety so um that will have to be handled very sensitively um yes I hadn't I need I would need to think about that sorry no it's fine oh, so it needs to be handled really sensitively doesn't it because you can't you can't then just um because you can't tell them it was your decision either because of that, then the blame. Yeah. So there's, there's no possibility of having any arrangement in place as my ex is out of the country and comes on an ad hoc basis. Um, is it advisable to get an official document in place as primary caregiver? Um, so I guess that's one for me. Um, in terms of having arrangements in place because the ex is out of the country, um, your time and your child's time still need to be respected and the court would expect that as well. Um, you know, it's, it's not an endorsed approach to have a parent waltzing in and out of a child's life with no consistency unless there is a good reason. Um, a reason for that might be with military families, it's harder to have 
the same consistency. Um, but if it's just a case of um, popping in and out of the country, depending on, you know, work or whatever, then I, I would expect you to be, a, be given enough notice um, and to have those boundaries in place that I need to know within a certain amount of time when you're coming and how long you're going to be here for and, you know, how, how long you want to see the child for. So they're all things that um, there are boundaries and there is structure that can be put in place that, you know, create some consistency for that child. Um, I mean, in terms of getting an official document, you, you would have to go through court proceedings to do that, um, which is only advisable if you are having real difficulty, because it's a long and difficult process. Um, but it's certainly something that you could obtain advice on. Um, so next question is, um, what if your ex does things you advise against, like put his financial worries on the children or talking about the other parent in a derogatory way? I think that is um, I th all that sort of thing I need needs to be covered in the co-parenting agreement, doesn't it? About sort of the emotional support that you're giving your children and um, how you're going to um, put on that sort of consistent front about. Um, and again, it all comes down to your values and it all comes down to how much of a secure emotional platform you want to create for your child. And I think so. I think there should be some robust agreements about that in the co-parenting arrangement. And if it was something that continued to happen and, and you felt the need to, to have court intervention, then there are options. You know, there are um, psychiatric assessments or psychologists that can get involved that will, will advise the court on the damage that that behaviour is having. And the court can regulate that contact if it's becoming an issue. Um, so last two questions. Can I, can, I just, can I just say that, again, it comes down to psychoeducation as well. Of, of, of that parent, it, it's really, um, because I don't think necessarily as, um, the, the individual's doing that de deliberately to cause harm, um, you know, they could be so sort of stressed and anxious themselves. Um, but I do think that if, if an individual understands that it is harmful to attachment, then, then they can, it does become a conscious decision if they continue to do it. And usually what the court would do in that situation is you would get a psychologist report and that psychologist would then advise on intervention that would be appropriate and that parent would be expected to engage in that intervention or anything kind of moved on. Um, so I guess we've got last, last two questions. Um, what's the best strategy for helping myself when my ex has a new partner? Um, and how can, um, is there any advice to help fathers who feel overwhelmed at this time? Fathers? Yes, fathers. It's hard, isn't it? Um, it is hard because there's, it returns your feelings of rejection and possibly your grief about the separation um, and what, was it that you they didn't want about you that you know they can have a, di a new person and so I think it's that it's that can really help to have um process your own feelings through get, getting some therapy or a counsellor to help you with that grief process um so that it doesn't start eating away at you um sometimes um I think we have to, this is part of the self-care post-divorce, is I've talked about helping children organise their feelings, but I think it's really important that you get help to organise your own feelings as well. And if that is through just a, through a counsellor, working through your grief, working through your emotions, I think I can't, I can't recommend that highly enough. Perfect. And then there's just one last comment in the Q&A, which relates to um, a, co a coach that someone had used. So if, if you're interested in that, then um, have a look at the Q&A um, section and there's a, an Instagram account that you can follow that um, one of our members has um, recommended. Um, so I guess for now, it's just a, a case of saying thank you for joining us. Um, it's been a really great discussion. Thank you, Sarah, for all of your insight and your, um, your really helpful advice. Um, as we said earlier, there will be a copy of this that's emailed out to everyone because it's been recorded. So if there's anything you missed or anything you want to take notes on, then you will have that opportunity to do so. 
um, over the next few days. And thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye.